Thanks for tuning in. We're Ace Comicals. I have with me my co-host Rahul Jani and Leon Everett. I'm Brett Driver. Let's get started. Hi guys, welcome to Ace Comicals episode number 29. I am joined by the usual suspects, Leon and Rahul. Um, and I think it's been quite a week this week, hasn't it, comics-wise? I mean, uh, what have you guys been up to? Um, I, I don't know, like, I've just been milling about. Uh, I think there was this uh, indie movie that came out uh, that no one's talking about, but uh, not really much to say on that. Oh, yeah, I've heard about that. Was it called Black Panther or something? Yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. This, uh, from this upstart indie studio called Marvel Studios. Yeah, um, you might have heard of them. Might have seen some of the things they've done. They've been fairly prolific. But, um, <laughs> BS aside, um, <laughs> I've, uh, since Tuesday, I've managed to watch Black Panther twice. Um, so, like, um, yeah, it's been it's been pretty good. So, obviously, there was a lot of um, hype leading up into their release and. We got the movie a few days before the Americans, um, and uh, me and Rahul had a, a concert on Tuesday uh, to see Kendrick Lamar, who, um, oddly enough, did the um, the soundtrack uh, for the film as well. Um, and we thought we had some time before, so we took half days, and uh, we uh, checked out Black Panther as one of the first people probably in the world who weren't pressed to see the movie. And... Um, I wasn't disappointed. Um, it's interesting because with things like this, sometimes the hype can overbuild, um, and I sort of have a defense mechanism uh, built in where I just dehype myself, despite loving trailers and listening to the the soundtrack the uh, the weekend before. But um, yeah, going going in, um, I try to keep away from reviews and stuff, and just divorce myself from the moment, and instead just check it out as a film. Um, and yeah, I really, really liked it. Um, I think it works on, um, a lot of different levels. Um, we'll have to go like deeper into it, uh, possibly in the future once, uh, every, everyone's seen it, but, um, yeah, uh, really good. I think, uh, like across the board, I think the, um, the, uh, acting was just, uh, top notch, um, especially, uh, special shout out to Michael B. Jordan and, uh, Letitia Wright, who just, um, just amazing in, in the film, but yeah, across the board, everyone's really good. I think the, um, the direction and, and writing, uh, really, uh, really interesting and go to places that we've never really been in a, in a Marvel film. And I think, um, beyond sort of, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big deal in terms of, uh, representation, um, and, um, the type of visuals we see on screen on such a big level um, uh, featuring uh, uh, black people at the center. And I think um, it does a good job of that, but it doesn't just rest on that, um, which is like a false narrative that you, you'd, you'd see bubbling up. Um, but actually it does a lot of interesting things with that and makes itself quite um quite a complete film that um, touches on a, a lot of different um, issues uh, across the board from from Africa and the uh, diaspora to uh, African-Americans, uh, obviously in America and all, all over, really. And I think it does a good job of that. Um, like, it, it's still a Marvel film, um, but it takes a lot of uh, risks in places where... Um, I wasn't um, sure it would. So um, I definitely recommend it. Um, obviously, I've seen it twice um, and had uh, decent audiences both times. And I, I think it's um, I think it's surprised a lot of naysayers, but also um, it's hopefully opened the door. Um, and I don't just mean from a, uh, an inclusion um, standpoint or like um, the opportunity to have more... Uh, big stories centered on people that they aren't usually centered on. But I, I think it's, um, I don't know, like different movies in the, in the, in the, the MCU canon so far 
some have like pushed in different directions and i think as we get towards the end of phase three a lot of the movies are uh being emboldened to do things a bit more off script and off the template um so that's quite exciting and i'm interested to see what um see what else we have um but i'll have much more to say if we do like a, a spoiler chat at some point um do you have any thoughts on it rahul yeah honestly i don't really have much to add to what you've just said because that was spot on um a couple of things i wanted to mention like you mentioned the trailer and the music in general like the the kendrick lamar ost is fantastic it's so good i've listened to it on loop all week um which is possibly because of just the hype of the concert we went to as well but just generally it's a really good album um the trailer i i went back on um on friday and had a look at um like on chrome it can it tells you how many times you've accessed a particular link there's one that i've been listening to which is the the trailers back to back in one video and it said i'd listened to it 122 times <laughs> since it's come out just because i had the the music on in the background and that that's the number of instances that i've opened that link that's not how many times i've let that link loop in the background so just to say music is fucking amazing um what else did i want to say um I, I think I've said this before about Marvel, where I've said, oh, this new one is the best Marvel film I've seen so far. I've said it about Civil War, I've said it about Spider-Man. I think I'm I'm fairly safe in saying, in my thoughts on saying that the that Black Panther is the best Marvel film that I've seen so far. <laughs> Certainly tonally, if only because it's, it's, it's found a, a level of maturity in its storytelling that I didn't expect. I was so unprepared for how good the writing is in this film. Um... And again, I don't want to spoil anything either, so I'm not going to go too far into it. And one of the things that I was trying to like figure out and puzzle out with you um, when we were, you know, we were chatting behind the scenes, um, and I have, I was telling you that I have like shards of African culture in my background because my parents um, were born and raised in Africa, in Uganda specifically, and so I've I've been um, exposed to certain, you know, cultural elements. Um, and seeing on screen, like the, the sights and sounds and peoples and voices, like it touched me in a really deep place that I really didn't expect. And it's just, it made me so happy to see, just to see the level of representation. And I mean, if it can mean that much to, to me as somebody who's neither black nor raised in Africa, I can only imagine what it must mean to, you know, to certain other people. So yeah, fantastic movie. Loved it. When you, when do you think you're going to be seeing it, Greg? Um, hopefully within the next week at some point, because much to my shame, I haven't actually managed to get out and see it yet. And I'm quite disappointed in myself, actually. <laughs> I mean, to um, be fair, it's going to be in, it's going to be on screen for ages. It's doing really well. So I, I think know. it's going to, it's going to be around for a while. So I think, I think uh, this week, I didn't want to go straight away this week because I had this whole thing in my head that it's just going to be rammed and it's just going to be a terrible experience. And I don't want anything to mar my experience of this film. So... I didn't. I I don't usually like to go straight away as soon as a film opens. Anyway, because of that reason, I tend to I tend to avoid release day nowadays. I mean, I used to. I used to be one of these people that would queue up at midnight to watch it, but um, I tend to try and avoid that now because of the types of people that end up in there and the fact that it's just because it's a, you know like a Friday evening or whatever and p- noisy people sitting watching the film with phones out and. <laughs> that's why you go at lunchtime on a tuesday which worked really well for us well if i could i would <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no um i think that's what i'm gonna do i think i'm gonna go within the next week and watch it at some point um and i'm gonna try and pick a quiet night uh midweek and uh i'm from the sounds of things i'm gonna thoroughly enjoy it for me this week it's been i mean i've not really done an awful lot uh apart from read comics play video games the usual um i was hype all week because i had been promised that i was going to get to play as the teenage mutant ninja turtles in injustice finally that the dlc was dropping this week and we were going to have the 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 turtles playable and then on the day that they're supposed to have been playable i'm i'm logging into my computer and i'm just checking out on steam you know i just wanted to have a quick look just to see if it was all there because i had this whole thing planned where me and leon were going to play at the weekend and i was going to try out the turtles and it was going to be really cool and they weren't there and i'm like why is the dlc not working so i'm trying all this stuff to get the dlc working and then i find an article that says actually 
they're not out on the PC version until the 20th of February. So it's kind of been delayed. So I knew I knew it was going to be delayed anyway for people that hadn't bought the Ultimate Pack when they bought the game or people that hadn't pre-ordered the game and got the Ultimate Pack as part of that. Um, the, release of, the release was going to be delayed and you'd be able to buy them like on the 20th next week. But actually, they're not actually... They're not actually going to be in the PC version full stop until the 20th, which is a bit irritating. <laughs> <laughs> You're just so thirsty for them turtles. Yeah, man, I was looking forward to getting to play as those guys. And, like, I've been watching gameplay videos and stuff like that, and the whole system with them where um, you can switch... To, to, to switch, basically, the, there's the, the, all four of them are, are one character, and you play as them together, and when you use certain moves, others will come in and help out. But you can switch the main turtle through the equipment um, system in Injustice. So um, anyone who's played, if you've played Injustice or if you haven't played Injustice, you've got this um, kind of kind of like a modification system for the characters, like an equipment system that changes how they look and uh, what color armor they're wearing and things like that. And um, also, in certain modes, it adds. Uh, it changes character attributes, so it allows you to uh, use certain attacks differently. Like you could, it, it'll add, a f- add features to attacks where you can use what's known as a meter burn move on an attack that you originally wouldn't be able to use a meter burn on. Um, and you get um, it, it like ups attack power and things like that on certain things. So, so like you can get like a set of, of gauntlets for Batman, for example, that when you equip them, it makes him do more damage. It makes him hit harder stuff like that but only in certain modes obviously in the interest of fairness it's it's great and i was looking really looking forward to it so i was a little bit bummed out about that but i still had a a big old pile of comics to get through and that i did so um keeping it dc i'm gonna move straight into my first pick which is the swamp thing winter special now this is well it's it's a it's a special so it's not a standard comic it's like a, a, a i think it's um 80 pages uh and uh, we've got the first part which is the main story which is written by tom king and the artist there is uh jason farbuck um you've got uh colors by brad anderson and letters by letters by a uh, darren bennett the main story of the book deals with themes of survival and it's swamp thing versus a, a monster a snow monster and there's this whole running conversation as well about what actually is a monster. Like, is because because people treat Swamp Thing as a monster, but is Swamp Thing a monster? It doesn't behave much like a monster sometimes. Um, and throughout the whole thing, he's protecting this child, and there's something off because the winter conditions are dulling his connection to the green. Uh, it's like this real unseasonal blizzard that's like ripping through the swamp and whatever. Um, his thoughts are clouded because of what's happening because he's not got a strong connection to the green. He can't think straight. Um, and this is largely Tom King doing what he does best, bringing real emotion and relatability to the page. Um, I find actually that all of his stories, they sort of represent a facet of the human condition. And there's usually a wider theme as well, overarching, um, like with some of his recent Batman issues and also in Mr. Miracle, um, each individual issue while, uh, dealing as a part of the larger story arc, has like an overarching theme throughout um and and for this one it it seems to me that it's like uh it's about not giving up and it's about you know when you have a bad day and just you just push through that bad day and the relatability is not just swamp thing that feels clouded at times and things like that because of because of what's going on around him like negatively affected by the weather and that kind of thing it, it's something that happens to everyone it's something that happens in winter to me sometimes where like winter conditions it's like you know the overbearing cold and the short dark days and it will you know it does it does take a toll on you sometimes i get it uh and i think that's one of the things that i really loved about it actually I, this is one of the things that i love about tom king's writing that he actually he takes something fairly mundane actually like things that that ordinary people feel or deal with and then applies that to the superhero world so we've got this unseasonal winter storm going on in the book and um, again this could also be viewed as a metaphor for depression I think as well which is something that I caught on with when I was reading it but I I like the story and I like how it's it's framed with um, 
talk from because it's like a radio show going in the background and it's framed with talk from a quarterback for the Gotham Knights. Um, obviously, it's like the sport, the sport portion of the radio show. So like a, a football show or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, him explaining how he was having an off day. Um, and the art, the artwork itself, it, it's like really highly detailed. And it really comes to life on the page, especially with the colours. Um, and I love the work in this book with small sequences over several panels and how seeing such small changes in movement represented actually animates the whole story and really gives it a flow. Um, I actually think there's great skill in representing actions in this way and not just leaving parts of the sequence to the gutters, I guess, between panels, if you understand what I'm saying, um, where you might get an instance of um, somebody picking an object up um like reaching down grabbing the object and picking it up uh some artists might be more economic and might illustrate that over two panels one with the person reaching down second one with the uh the arm coming back up with the item or somebody may do three panels reach down grab back up uh but what what we're getting here is we're getting like a, a movement or or an action over several panels. There's this great bit where Swamp Thing pulls off his hand and lights it on fire to create a set, a, a source of heat for him and this boy uh, that he's looking after within in this storm. Um, and it's like a panel, a blow by blow of the hand on the ground slowly catching fire and turning into a, a full on fire that they can warm themselves on. Um, and that is that's one of my favorite parts of the book. That's one of my favorite sequences in there in the story. Um, and I love I love it when when artists do that. When when you are given each stage of an action like that, rather than leaving it to the gutters, I quite like that. I think, I think mm. it takes real skill to to illustrate something with such minute changes and keep it consistent. Um. And it's always a treat to see something like that. Uh, I I also enjoy how through the artwork in this one you get a real sense of Swamp Thing being an amalgam of plant life. Like when he loses part of himself or he changes form, um, you actually see like individual vines, individual leaves. You know, like you see what he's made of. He is made of plants. He is Swamp Thing. He's part of the green. Um, uh, it's one of the things that I've always loved about Swamp Thing actually is, is seeing the process when he rebuilds himself or when he changes himself and it's yeah it's just such a such a beautiful story such a beautiful comic and the work with the snowscapes um, early on in the story as well there's like some great pages where it's like a, a almost full whiteout a blizzard and uh, the way the lettering's handled in these pages because there's obviously some talk there's some conversation going on and it's like the, the because you wouldn't be able to hear a thing out there and it's and, and slowly as swamp thing walks away the 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 lettering it, it the, the the words are lost to the white out and i think it's great how it becomes less and less legible the further away he gets in this storm like gives you a real sense of what's actually going on um and and the the, the raw power or whatever of the blizzard in the story now the second portion of the book is uh, more of a tribute to uh, the original creators of Swamp Thing, Len Wein and Bernie Wrightson, um, both of whom we lost last year. Um, and I think I think it's quite nice. I, I really like what what they've done here because um, there's a short note from the editor uh, Rebecca Taylor. Um, and she's she's written like a short note introducing this next part. Uh, the next part being an unfinished story by Len Wein that was um, Pencils and Inks by Kelly Jones. Um, Kelly Jones has done a lot of Batman stuff previously. Um, and this it is presented as is. No, there's no... Um, there's no lettering. There's no words. It's just presented as is, um, as far as it got, basically, uh, with colours that have been added by um, Michelle Madsen. And there's something 
it's really beautiful about seeing a comic without words on it, you know, like in, in this state. And there's something really um, kind of nice about how they've done this in tribute to Lemwine as as like a, it's kind of like a you know because it's it's like a silence you know you know when you would hold like a a, a silence in memory of someone or something mm. um and you've got this this comic to flip through and there's a, it, it and it's like a full issue but there's no words on it and it, it's like a, it is like a silence and you kind of get um you know at, at the end of that <clears throat> they've actually printed the script in its entirety. So the original script that Len Wein wrote as well has been printed in there afterwards. So you can kind of see how each panel fits together. And it also actually shows you the power of artwork in comics itself anyway. And like the fact that you don't really need words to understand what's going on half the time. You can see, you know, like I could I can piece this story together without reading the script. It's great. Um, yeah, and I really liked it and thought it was a really fitting tribute. I did. Um, the story would, uh, it was like the last thing that Lemwine did and it would have been originally a continuation of a miniseries that he did called uh, Swamp Thing, The Dead Don't Sleep. Um, and it's like presented unfinished in the back of this book and I really enjoyed that. And it's it's really something quite nice and special, I think, and quite uh, quite touching, actually. So, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like um, a, a good book. I'll, I'll have to give that a read um, for the next episode and uh, like chime in because it does sound very um, uh, like um, good, uh, like well looking and like um, interesting in concept. Mm. Well, I could I could talk about it all day because I'm a huge Swamp Thing fan. So that's yeah. that's, <laughs> that's me rambling that, on. That was my spiel, but yeah. And that's the thing. I, I've never read any something. <clears throat> He's always been on the fringes or adjacent of of other of, uh, stories, and I've mm. always meant to because um, I think it was Alan Moore had a good run with him. Um, yeah, but I never got around to it. Yeah, the Alan Moore Swamp Thing is pretty cool. Um, and also, um, there's the recent New Fifty Two Swamp Thing stuff that's really good as well. Both good places to start. So, and for for regular listeners, this is the one that Greg has been talking about every single episode since <laughs> I think November. Is that right? Like you've been excited for it for a while. Yeah, since since I first saw it pop up, I've been, I've had it on my list of things to look forward to. Mm. It's just like swamp thing, swamp thing, swamp thing, and now I finally got it, swamp thing. Um, so yeah, probably actually since November. Actually, I might have first mentioned it back then. Yeah, <laughs> certainly would have known about it around then. Um, um, it might have been delayed. I don't know, but. Um, yeah, it's a great, it's a great little, great little book. I love it. So, how um, is um, oh, Tom King so goddamn prolific at the moment? <laughs> I don't know, but I'm not complaining. <laughs> and it's not, it's not like he's just phoning it in. It sounds like yeah. I've only uh, been mostly reading, um, obviously, Mister Miracle, but it sounds like he's been um, knocking it out of the park with Batman uh, as well as this and a, yeah. a few other things. I see I his name on. I don't think the man's capable of phoning it in. I... <laughs> I don't think he can. I, I think he'd be physically I, yeah. sick. <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, to, I think. Yeah, it. it'd be a cold day in hell when he phones it in. <laughs> anyway, onward to the next one. So this one's quite topical because obviously this week we have February fourteenth, which is Valentine's Day, which was also New Comic Book Day, um, and we were given um, a book called The Death of Love. Uh, this was published by Image. And uh, the story is by uh, Justin Jordan. We have the art and cover um, by uh, Donald DeLay. Um, the colours are by an Omar Estevez. And uh, the colours, specifically on pages one to five of the book, are by a Philippe Sobriero. Um, letters by Rachel Deering throughout the entire issue. So, this one... Um, but like down about a down on his look nice guy uh, who gains the ability nice guy in inverted commas with the capital letters that and and everything that that signifies because he is a dick and he gains the ability <laughs> to see Cupid a responsible for love and decides to go to war with love itself wielding a chainsaw uh long story short um leon you picked this up as well didn't you 
Yeah, yeah. Um, picked it off off your recommendation, um, and it is very um, very stylized and curious take on the whole pickup artist PUA uh, um, sort of view and uh, toxic masculinity with uh, in in the twenty first century, especially with a lens of like freak fantasy and um yeah it, it definitely feels like uh justin jordan had some things he wanted to talk about here and um he puts um all those things like uh directly uh i guess in the in the target but he's not trying to hit it with love <laughs> he's hit, he's hitting it with a a, a pretty uh explicit uh takedown yeah uh, and having this sort of uh, fantasy lens on there allows him to push in. So you, you do have uh, Philo, Philo, the, the the lead character. Yeah. And he is that sort of sad, sacky, Chandler-type guy who's just down on his luck in women, and he's been fed all the stuff that society feeds us, really. And it's like, nice guys finish last, and... Um, uh, got to do all these games and stuff. He's like friends with this girl called Zoe, but it, in it, all the typical tropes where he's saying uh, he listens to all those stories complaining about boyfriends and stuff. And he's like playing the long game. He's waiting it out because he's going to swoop in and uh, make his move and stuff. And that like, he's just waiting for her to realize like all, all this well-mapped sort of uh, sad, sad territory that they've been on. And, um, it is interesting because he goes and takes his friend to this like poor. Uh, it, it's like a, a talk, uh, like motivational speaking. It kind of reminds me of Tom Cruise's character in Magnolia, and he's all like, "Yeah, you got you got to do all this," and like it, he's using all this uh, like behavioral pseudoscience to like to sort of facilitate, uh, facilitate the misogyny and, and so all the normal tropes. Or, and then you have like sequences where uh, like they're using nagging and just all of the sort of signifiers that we are sort of well aware of now. And obviously that backfires within in the comic for it the, all... for, yeah, for the free dudes we're sort of following during that, during that part. Yeah. All backfires spectacularly. And it's great how they play that out. I really love that bit. Um, and I love how his friend reacts to everything as well. Yeah, like, his friend yeah. sort of feels like almost not Gary Stu, but he kind of looks like the author <laughs> and he, he seems like he's the voice of reason. Yeah. No, I like it. I like it. And I like the um, I like how nicely this is all framed at the end with the kind of like the letter from the uh the from the writer of the story yeah um and i i i kind of like where it's going and i like what it's doing i like that it's actually standing up and it's challenging everything and it's it 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 challenges the behavioral problems head on of you know th- this 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 part of dating culture this part of society this this uh toxic masculinity this pick up artist stuff this nice guy stuff um and and these people that it i mean he even said it's an easy trap to fall into like he says but it's not something that you should you know anyone should ever kind of feel sorry for him for because what he's doing is bad you know he's he's a dick and it's even mm. fully explained to him like his friend challenges him on it and explains it to him put and lays it out in front of him like it's like you're just putting tokens into a vending machine and expecting that one day sex will fall out, and that's not yeah. how life works. <laughs> it's like very, a yeah. very transactional view of yeah. uh, uh, relationships with the opposite sex. Um, that's something like th- th- it's this movie's uh, movie. This comic is not uh, particularly abstract in what it's trying to say. It's actually <laughs> no. almost on the nose and very yeah. uh, explicit. But I think the whole fantasy element of that um uh allows that to be a thing where it doesn't feel preachy because i mean some of these points are like 
a cold take. Uh, like uh, we uh, feel like we sort of had that discussion, and now pure stuff feels like it's uh, on the fringes. Mm. But what what's happened is that on we've had the evolution of that, where it's just sort of permeated society, and you have yeah. your your suffix gates um, and other ever like tr- trolling um communities and that that feels like it's been the next stage it's like um misogyny um like level 100 or something like that so it it is, it is interesting but um i like that it does piv- uh, pivot on that whole pickup uh, artist culture but also on like uh men's rights stuff uh and um the whole red pill males like it literally has red pills in there yeah and yeah <laughs> the, the dude uh, even uh he, he even uh as he's talking about the red pills he even like uh quotes uh morpheus which is like the whole uh, i mean this whole thing of being like a red pill male and like escaping the matrix of like i don't know cuckdom or whatever and um <laughs> the uh the, the way how um the matrix is in some ways been bastardized by that whole movement is uh it, it, like the he, the writer's not not messing around um yeah and like i don't think it ends up being feeling preachy though especially for what is sort of promised mm. in terms of the tone and style of the book so i'm interested to see where it goes um it has that um I noticed on some panels that sexy image purple in there, and it's it's not an image comic about the perp. Yeah, it's yeah, got oh, <laughs> yeah. And I think overall, I think the uh, the colors are really good. I love the uh, striking red that we get throughout, and um, yeah, it, it. I don't know. It, it feels like it doesn't feel overtly cartoony, but I like how. The characters are stylized in quite a, an interesting way. I say mm. interesting a lot, um, but like um, they look individual in, in a way that I quite like. So um, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing where the story goes. Is this um, meant to be a limited run or anything, or is it just as is, like one of whatever? Um, it is. Uh, it is going to be a limited run. It is a five part. Uh, okay, because it feels so, like that. It feels yeah. like it's g- yeah. going to have a complete story. I don't. I. I. Yeah, I think it's going to be like a, a, a start, middle, end, and it's over five comics, and it's going to be quite uh, closed. Because I think I think it is just meant to be like a one-offy type thing, and it's. Mm. Um, what you were saying about the art, yeah, I love how it has a cartoon edge to it, and it's expressive and caricaturish without taking it to an extreme, so that we don't yeah. lose all the reality and the actual message. But there's definitely enough of an edge to it that when you get the fantasy violence and you start seeing the Cupid with the arrows and things like that, it's not jarring or out of place. Yeah. It all kind of meshes together quite nicely. No, and, definitely. Um, and what you were saying about the red pills and stuff, when, when, when it hit the matrix page, I actually laughed out loud. Right? <laughs> and it's, it's, it's not like you say, it's not preachy. It's more of like a wry take on that yeah. kind of toxic culture and a, a, a kind of a, um, it's like it's like really cutting satire, actually. I think more than anything else. Yeah, I, I would say so. Yeah. Um, and but, I'll just add, like, how goddamn freaky are those uh, Cubidae? Like, ugh. I know. I hate their faces. <laughs> but I think <laughs> they're meant. To, I think they're meant to be freaky. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the whole idea. But yeah, I think uh, next uh, next issue, I think he's going to obviously. This is where he starts revving up the chainsaw. But um, yeah. We'll see what happens with that. See how it all pans out and ends. So, on from there, uh, another new book that I picked up, um, which was called Cold War. Now, this is Aftershock Comics, um, which are um, kind of like a kind of like an indie comics publisher. Um, we have the writer of this story is Christopher Sabela, um, and the artist, colorist, and letterer, and cover artist is Hayden Sherman. Uh, now, I loved this comic. Um, one of the main reasons for that is I 
I mean, it's not a one man band, but I like one man bands. So I, I talk about it a lot with comics where it's this, it's one person's work. The whole thing is one person's work. Now, this is the, the whole thing of this is like it, it's almost one person's work. I mean, yeah, there's a writer there, but the the, the actual visual elements of it are all down to one man and I love I love what he's done with it. Um now this book is brutal, unwavering, and just ah oh, it's so good to read, so visceral. It's it's basically it, it, in its depiction of a dystopian future, um it it's like it, it's kind of like you know like um Everything you'd fear about being uh, put into a kind of a, a stasis um, state or frozen for a hundred odd years or whatever. Like everything you wouldn't want to wake up to, this book has it. Um, so I'll, I'll read the blurb that comes from uh, like the official the official blurb for it. So the uh, this is from the Aftershock website. So, um, Panacea Cryonics offered its customers life after death by keeping their heads frozen until the day technology could rebuild them, free of disease and death. However, as these everyday people from the past are revived, they're not handed the keys to a new life, but a gun, body armour and an ultimatum. They must fight in a war against unknown opponents for unknown reasons to secure their place in a brave new world that doesn't want them around. So... Like the art from the get go is completely, it's absolutely spectacular, and it is a definite nod to Frank Miller. Like if you've ever seen any of like Frank Miller's stuff, which I'm pretty sure you have, um, I think it's quite hard these days not to have seen any of Frank Miller's artwork. Um, it's it's got that style about about it. It's got those thick lines and um, flat colours and like dark shadows and just square edges you know how he everything he draws is quite angular it's got a lot of that about it and i I think it's all the better for it and i really like it it's definitely a nod to frank miller um the writing in this book is uh, it's hard to, to talk too much about the first issue without spoiling it but it's the writing's brilliant and there's a brilliant twist at the end of the first book. Um, it is pretty heavy on the stimulus. It's pretty sensory overload when you're flicking through it. But I think it's designed that way so that you get a sense of what the characters are experiencing. So like the, the absolute disorientation of waking up nearly 600 years in the future and then being instantly as soon as you wake up, you're sent out to fight kind of thing in a world that you don't recognize anymore with some weird and wonderful enemies. <laughs> like, are they robots? Are they aliens? We don't know. We just know that we have to shoot them kind of thing. Uh, and the designs are quite cool. Some really, really cool, weird and wonderful designs for some of the enemies. Um, the pacing is great throughout the book as well. As well as it being sensory overload, the pacing's fantastic. You don't actually feel like anything is being skipped. And the hard, thick lines and bright colours means that it, it's like it's like an uppercut. Like when you open it, and it's like and, and there's some fresh and different page panel layouts as well that play to the strengths of the art. And coupled with um, the use of onomatopoeia in some panels as well, like you've got like um, it'd be the end of a gun, like a long, thin panel, horizontal end of the gun with a bullet coming out of it type thing. Uh, and then um, the onomatopoeia behind that in the background. Uh, this kind of thing is what we're seeing, and it's great. It's very stylish. Um, I, I just want to see where this goes next, yeah. Uh, I've not got much else to say about it, because I've only had one issue in front of me, and it's... Yeah, I don't I don't want to talk too much about it, because if I talk too much about it, I end up spoiling it. I end up spoiling the twist. Uh, the thing that's going to sort of... Um, hook you in like it did with me but what i will say is that it starts off fairly stereotypical for a comic of this kind and then completely flips that on its head so moving on from there um i guess we're into leon and rahul territory now because these are books that i haven't read uh the next two on the list so 
I think this was this first one on the list here that we've got with which uh, which is just the, the, my two co-hosts. It was uh, Twisted Romance and Leon. Um, this was yours, wasn't it? Yeah, this is one that I uh, read on recommendation. I've read the first two issues. Um, if I'm correct, um, there's going to be four of them, and it feels like they've been they were coming out weekly because I've just caught up on uh, these two. But it feels like they've been they're uh, coming out. Um, I guess to capitalise on being closer to Valentine's Day. Mm. Um, but yeah, they're like a series of, uh, it's like an anthology series about uh, like sort of subversive uh, love. I mean, it's in the title. Um, but yeah, like love stories have gone wrong or with some sort of odd complication. And the first two issues um, have three stories in them. Um, and it's usually two comics bookending um like a prose story um i haven't got around to reading the uh prose stories in each of them but um yeah it it is interesting for me and it is a bit you do get a bit of whiplash (laughs) you finish reading a comic and then boom just eight pages of like of like uh of text um which is fine but um yeah um i'll um give those a read um but yeah um focusing on like the first issue which i think rahul's read as well Uh um the first comic uh old flames which is uh by uh katie skelly and uh, alex decampi it's uh like without going too much into it, because they are quite short stories, but it's uh, a weird tale, a, a quite supernatural tale about like um, a succubus, really, who is like a private eye catching out um, uh, like cheating spouses and all, all the normal types of tropes. Um, and you sort of spend some time in that world as that character gets a uh, a job and has to get evidence and tell someone. But, um, yeah, you get pulled into this sort of world, which is like um, like indeterminal time period in a cool way that I like. So the disco's very 70s, but everywhere else feels like different time periods, kind of. Like, um, it's not really settled. You just have this this world and... Yeah, like, I, 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 I enjoyed this story, though I, every now and again, I do tend to have issues with some of the slightness of short stories of, of this kind, because I really like short stories that do have, like, full beginning, middle, and end. And this one does, but then this one horribly feels like uh, an issue one. <laughs> It feels like it's setting up the, this world where it, um, I don't think it is, but um, yeah, like the art style is is really is really cool. I like um, the hand hand drawn messy lines and like um, the sort of web comicy long noses and like block colors with no shading um, and the cool sort of blood splatter backgrounds of the uh, protagonist's um, office. Um, and like just other flourishes, like um, you have these flashback panels which are just black, white, and red, and it, it's really simple but effective. Um, and yeah, it was it was uh, I'd say like a, a decent uh, introduction into the um, into the book. Um, and I was wondering where um, like if there was going to be like an. Uh, Beyond the whole twisted romance uh, theme, I thought that I was wondering if there's going to be a, um, like an issue specific overarching theme. It doesn't really feel so because the uh, after the prose story um, called Lever and Lace by uh, Majen uh, Cubed or Cubed, uh, you have a story called Red Medusa uh, by Sarah Horrocks, and I always admire. Uh, bold art and storytelling styles. Um, like when I was younger, I used to be a lot more conservative um, in in the types of styles that I resonated with. Um, and just getting older and reading a lot more, I'm always open um, 
for for stars which aren't um, as clean um, as not really the standard, but from what we are used to when you open up a fresh comet. Um, but I, I found this one to be just too messy, um, and the mess wasn't helped by it being really slight and impressionistic. And it's just weird because I, I, I do quite like things that uh, take chances and risks, but because of the slightness, it just felt like an experimental project um, in a way that it, it left me a bit cold. Um, and like, I think there, I usually have an issue with like messy lettering um, where it's like, it, it, it's, I know hand drawn stupid because of how they're done, but it has like, Oh, it's just scribbled in pen um, as, as part of it. Uh, and I get the immediacy of doing that and uh, how it stays on message doing that. But intangible legibility drives me insane. Um, and when the, uh, the art and flow of story and pace within those uh, few pages is so um, obscure and indeterminable, it it didn't do well to not uh, sort of push me away, so I wasn't as big a fan of that, um, unfortunately. What were your thoughts, um, Rahul? Yeah, I think I'm glad you went first because I think you expressed a lot of this better than I could have. I I I flip flopped on this comic. Um, I was excited for it going in just because I liked the concept, um, but I was. Um, I was shocked by a couple of revelations. Like one, I didn't realize it was going to be an anthology series. So I've flicked through issue number two and I didn't realize that it wasn't going to be continuing on the story from issue number one. So that's already a bit of a disappointment because I did like the the plot of this. And like you said, I kind of, it does feel just like part one, number one of an ongoing story. And I kind of do wish there would be more there. Um, the second thing is I was, I went into it expecting it to be like subversive, but sweet. And it turns out to be quite, um, like violent and um, shockingly adult, and so that I think I was impressed, but because I, I'd had my expectations subverted. So I think on the second pass, I actually enjoyed this comic a little less than I was hoping for. Um, I know what you mean about it being like slight and experimental in that final story, because it's it's almost like it's formless. It doesn't have um, like a cohesiveness in what it's trying to do. I feel like it's throwing experimentation at the wall and seeing what sticks. And I think that that didn't mesh with me in a similar way that it seems not to have meshed with you. Um, from what I can tell uh, of the brief skimming that I've done of issue two, I feel like that seems like it's going to be more my speed. So I'd like to give that a proper go and then I'll, I'll definitely have more to say on that for the next episode, I think. Yeah. Um, with, with the issue two, which I've, I've read, um, mm. I do find... The main story in that, the first one, Twinkle and the Star by Alejandra Gutierrez and uh, Alex de, de Campi returning. Um, I quite like that story, um, so I'm interested to hear what you have to say about it because um, I think it's, um, it's, it, it's a good exploration of... Uh, like where it starts and where it ends are different points and it's a good exploration of stuff that we don't really see character wise um and i and i quite a kind of liked what it was doing and um yeah there seemed to be quite a um a cohesive uh use of storytelling in that which um I quite liked. I mean, it, it, it isn't perfect, and I've got some nuanced feelings on it. But um, yeah, I'm interested to uh, to talk to talk with you um, about that when you've read it. Yeah, definitely. I'll have some. I'll make sure I spend some time on that for the next one. Um, yeah, and I think uh, it's similarly like it leads on. I think okay, so issue number two of um, Twisted Romance, I feel like has a similar style and possibly a similar theme to the book that I wanted to talk about next, which I, I also think you've read, right? Uh, Bingo Love? Yeah, I have. Yeah. So this is a new book that came out this week by T. Franklin, 
um, with art by Jen St. Ange, that's spelled S T hyphen O N G E, colors by Joy San, letters by Cardinal Ray, and a cover by Genevieve Eft. Um, so, this book, Bingo Love, is about grandmothers in love. Um, more specifically, about it's about these two young black women, Elle and Marie, um, who meet in the 1960s and instantly become friends and fall in love. Um, and the story is told from Elle's perspective, and it follows the influence that uh, meeting Marie has on her life. Um, and just as they reach the point where they can finally admit their feelings to each other, they are they're discovered, um, outed as uh, being uh, gay lovers, and cruelly torn apart from each other. So both these young women have to make these choices to appease the anger that their forbidden love seems to have caused in their parents and their grandparents and their community, um, namely both finding men to marry and starting traditional families. So we follow... We follow Elle going through the routine of her family life after this has happened to her, um, and the complicated and like subtle tensions caused by the secrets that she's keeping. Um, we see her like fully love her children and her grandchildren and commit to her husband, um, you know, despite their loveless marriage. And this uneasy equilibrium um, is like eventually appended when she runs into Marie again um, when they're in their late 60s or early 60s, I believe. And this the reunited couple, they, they again have to make more difficult choices which will affect the families around them, but this time it's their partners and their children. Um, but now they're in a world where attitudes have shifted regarding homosexuality. So it's to me, it was, it was a story about hard compromises and stolen time. It's like, it's unforgiving, unapologetic, and kind of beautiful about the decisions that these women have to make about their own lives and their own happiness based on the whims of others. And in some ways, to me, it felt like I ended this book feeling like I just sat through a war story, like a war movie, where a young, happy couple are ripped apart by external forces and then find each other again years later, you know, after having moved on. And then suddenly you're united. They they have to work hard to to find the happiness that they deserve. Like I I, I loved this book. Um, finally, really finally balances the effects that their their love and you know the thing that they have for themselves has on the people in their lives, but without discounting how the women themselves feel and you know their own right to be happy. And it really clearly communicates. This is something that I felt was quite new to me. It really clearly communicates how much they sacrifice to keep others happy. And not like just the behaviors that they had to change in order to play these roles that they weren't necessarily suited for, but the emotional weight that results from these behavior changes. We like we really do feel that Elle is being torn apart between the love of her family and her love of Marie. And like just how cruel the situation is in more than more than a black and white right and wrong way um it makes your heart bleed for these women who want nothing more than just to love each other um i don't know if you have any thoughts on the story like that leon um yeah i do i mean i definitely co-sign what you've said um and yeah the thing with this book it's manages to be heartwarming um and touching but also uh devastating and heartbreaking mm. uh and it's so good at sort of putting us in L's uh sort of shoes and walking through uh life in her shoes and uh ostensibly or in a way uh in a, it's one of those things where it makes a specific general and if not L, you can think of uh, hundreds of thousands of people who've been in uh, the similar situation who uh, effectively uh, uh, were born in the wrong era, mm. uh, born uh, too soon uh, for society where uh all of the sort of strides of progress that we've made uh, have, have for a lot of these people come too late. Um, and yeah, the feeling of stolen time is so brutal. It, um, it definitely gave me shades of uh, Black Mirror's San Junipero episode. Um, and also Moonlight. Um, and 
Ah, it's just, yeah, there's, there's such a mix of emotions here, but it doesn't feel like melancholy porn or like, uh, cynical or sad. It's quite a lovely book. Um, and it's quite, uh, there's, there's a joy to it at the beginning when, uh, they're just, uh, kids in school. Um, there's so much love and joy and, um, just cheer in the book, and despite them being separated, Ellie is just such a just lovely protagonist to be with. Someone mm. who is just so loving, um, so caring, um, but um, also just super thoughtful, um, and always wants the best, and t- makes uh, lemonade out of lemons uh, for her life. Uh, like being like a housewife, she dedicated a lot of her time to um being like a good a really good uh, d- uh, like fashion designer like seamstress type um and like she's so resourceful um and uh like you just you can feel the loss there and i don't know i, I love stuff that covers wide amounts of time with this and i think the um uh jen saying sen onge sen Ange, um, Saint Ange, yeah. Saint Ange. Um, her artwork is so beautiful, um, and the character designs at uh, in the various age levels and eras feel so complete. Um, and like Ellen, Mary, just um, they just bounce off the page, really. Hmm. Um, and what's beautiful with this as well, uh, as we. Uh, um, coming to contact with more characters and like uh, uh, Elle's um, uh, kids and grand- grandkids, uh, it just benefits from such a diverse range of uh, skin tones, body shapes, and facial designs. It's just mm-hmm. something that's just lovely to see. Um, uh, and yeah, it's quite apt in, in this moment. I mean, this book came out uh for valentine's uh during uh us black history month and you can sort of feel all of these sort of uh cultural tracks um coming together and meeting um and like connected with the uh discussion we we're having earlier um with uh, black panther um and it, it it definitely feels just like uh now is a time w- uh where artists and creatives of color uh, are being afforded more freedom to tell a, a wider range of a uh, wider array of stories, um, and it adds a uh, complexity, uh, an intersectional complexity to to these people, where they're not just um, a checkpoint. So they're not just this is a black person or this is a gay person or this is a gay person who's black. Instead, mm-hmm. these are the full formed characters who are just informed by the tragedies and uh, experiences and joys of um, other characters. And it's, it's nice to see um, a different array of um, these experiences and, and emotions displayed ahead. So I, I got, got a lot of joy from uh, reading this book and I, I just love how it, it, it transitioned um, and how you just in the space of these pages, you got to see like the shifting attitudes of like uh, some people like family members and such like it's very much a book centered on love and that being like romantic love or for, and forbidden love, but also like family love and what it actually means to love um, like love t- to love people and not be in love with them um, mm-hmm. to be to do things for tradition and culture to, to keep the family together um, to, to sacrifice uh, happiness, to, to live without a part of yourself, to sacrifice uh, uh, a fraction of your soul uh, because society is sort of pushed, pushed us this way. It is, it's, it's, it's really it's, it's a lot it's you, you do feel it when reading it and uh but i wasn't i was i was filled with like a complex emotion while reading it um and i didn't feel like super sad didn't feel like mega happy i just felt like 
I don't know. I, I, I felt like, like I was saying, a, a heartwarming and a heartbreaking while reading it. And it's just such a good read. Um, I would just recommend this to, to all, really. It's, and I know, like, it's just, I think it's so successful in, um, creating this character, um, and giving us an insight into her world and experiences. Yeah, fully agree with what you just said. Like, it's very bittersweet. So for every every like crushing loss that you see, there's you know there's glimmers of more love and more humanity because the the love that she loses from losing her you know her life partner in some ways, um, she gains she gains a family, she gains this love in her children, her grandchildren, and the love that surrounds her from that and the understanding that we see coming from there. It's just it's it's a really wonderful and like nuanced story. I think. Yeah. Um, some touch points that I had. So you mentioned Moonlight. I had I had a note on that as well. Just with, like you said, the the complexity and not just ticking boxes. Um, so you do have these fully formed characters, which you know are allowed to be more than just the cliches you would expect from, uh, you know, maybe some previous works that try and tackle the same topics of race and gender alignment and and such and such. Um, another one I thought of was Atonement. So this is, like I said, it reminded me of a war story, and not just the the like not just the circumstances that rip people apart but the harm caused by others by not necessarily selfish decisions but like culturally motivated decisions of other people and what will it mean to the community and how could you do this to us you know um and that kind of thing and then the last one like and again i think you mentioned this because you were saying l is such a like a lovely, loving character. It reminded me of Parks and Rec a little bit. Like, you know, you have Leslie Nope, and you find it's a TV show filled with ideal people. You want, you know, your ideal boss, your ideal partner, your ideal friend. And I think I, there's, there's shades of that in this as well. Um, yeah, I loved it. It's subtle, unflinching, and like ultimately quite joyful story of, you know, the harms of compromise that I've ever seen. So 100% recommended. Uh, I will have to pick both of those up and read them. Um, moving on from there, it's back to one that I read again, which is um, Exit Stage Left, The Snagglepuss Chronicles. Now, this is uh, one of DC's line of comics where they reimagine classic Hanna-Barbera characters and um, bring them into into the world in different ways or do different things with them. Um now, this is two issues in now, so I wanted to, I've mentioned it before, but I wanted to wait until I had two issues in front of me before I started to talk about it, really, because I think I needed two issues. Um, Snagglepuss has been reimagined as a gay Southern Tennessee Williams style playwright in this book, um, and it's set in the 1950s, specifically 1953, during a nuclear arm race with the Soviets, and we've got the House Committee on Un-American Activities targeting um, subversive voices in show business and sort of slowly pushing them out um, in a... Uh, it's it's censorship and it's, um, it's using the Cold War as an excuse to censor subversive voices and to get rid of things that they, they might not agree with um, and to to be homophobic, basically, and to be... Um, to push people down, and keep people down and in line. Um, and we the heat is basically being turned up on Snagglepuss himself, so he's got a new play out and uh, they've taken an interest in him. The uh, House Committee of Un-American Activities have... Um, now this this book combi- combines the very real with the very surreal. On the one hand, you've got multicolored anthropomorphic animals walking around with humans side by side, um, and they are drawn in a way that they could they they're taken to uh, it's taken to a level where it's like a human that looks like a lot a mountain lion rather than it being a cartoon of an anthropomorphic mountain lion, it's literally like, it's human anatomy with a mountain lion head. If that makes sense. Um, it's, uh, 
it works surprisingly well actually this art style um with the heavy story and subject matter it's, i mean this book covers themes like the difficulties of living as a, an lgbt person during that time uh, uh, uh which is something that you guys have touched on when you've talked about bingo love uh it, it's it's the same kind of the, it's it's got those kind of themes in it where because it's the 1950s it's not the done thing and you've got um it, it touches on the fact that um snagglepuss has had has to hide the fact that he's gay uh like for public appearances and things like that he appears alongside an actress who um i think they pretend is his wife um, and then obviously he drops her off after he's done with whatever he's doing and then, uh, goes and meets his boyfriend. Um, and you've got like, um, another character in there, Huckleberry Hound, who, uh, he's a novelist and he's been run out of his, uh, he, uh, he's got a, like a wife and a, a child and he's been run out of his hometown, um, because he, um, I don't know if he, if he's supposed to be bi or if he's gay and was living a lie, uh, but he's been run out of his hometown because they caught him with another man, basically. Um, and he's gone to um, he's gone to where Snagglepuss is. Um, you, the other the other character that appears in it is Squidly Diddley, um, who is a uh, a fail a failed musician <laughs> or a, a struggling musician, um, much. Uh, very, very much similar to what he is in the original Hanna Barbera cartoons, actually. So that's kind of cool. Um, the artwork itself, it's clean and vibrant, and it leans more to realism, despite the cartoonishness of some of the character designs. So, despite the fact we've got anthropomorphic animals walking around side by side with humans, it's you know, and you do get a chuckle out of it from time to time because there is that kind of like ridiculous edge to it. And like Leon said before. I would love to have been in the room for this pitch. When when they walked in and said what they wanted to do, I would love to have been there to hear it and to see like the looks on some of these people's faces where they're trying to add two and two together and figure out how this is going to work. But I think I think it's great and I, I think it revels in the fact that it's, it's a little bit on the ridiculous side where the character designs are concerned and things and it does very well with that. Um there's a bonus backup story in issue two, uh, which is called Sasquatch Detective, which is a, a bit of light-hearted fun and absurdity about a Sasquatch joining the LAPD and uh, the hilarity and hijinks that follow. And the art's fun and vibrant and the writing's quite sharp with gags and references to films and stuff. So it's it's kind of like buddy cop thing where you've got like a, um, a human and then um, his partner is this Sasquatch and she... Uh, in this first story, she is recounting all the times that she's had to wear different disguises and things and gotten away with it. Like, even though she's quite clearly a Sasquatch. Um, and stuff like that. It, it's quite it's quite funny. I quite enjoyed it. I like things like that. Um, with the... With, but, well, yeah. With, with this book in, in general, I think, I, think it's I think it's really good. And I think it's a really nice reimagining of a classic character. And I, I really like what they've done with it. And I think it's quite clever in places as well, actually. And, uh, yeah, no. I'm enjoying it, definitely, and I, I will be carrying on with it, and I really want to see where this goes. Yeah, this is another one where, um, on your recommendation, it sounded quite interesting, but now you've read it, 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 it definitely sounds like something I want to dig into. Yeah, you, you'd enjoy it. It's like, it, it's, I, I just imagine, like, to, like, the, 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 um, the creative team behind this were just sitting around, maybe like, um, like drinking or something like. There's like, all of a sudden, what if Snagglepuss was Tennessee Williams? You know, <laughs> <laughs> and then like from there, basically, it's like. But yeah, no, I I really like it. I do enjoy it. Um, and then uh, we're at the end of my list now because I'm going to move on to a number one that I picked up, which um. I was quite hyped for this because it's got a little bit of an all-star team behind it. I mean, you've got um, Ivan Brandon, who is responsible for Black Cloud, uh, which I've been reading. Uh, and you've got um, Asad Ribrich, who is your guy from Secret Wars and Uncanny X-Force. So 
this one I had I had I had I had high expectations for it. I wasn't disappointed. Um so this is versus this one's called just versus VS. Um so yeah, story Ivan Brandon, art and cover Esad Ribrich. Uh variant cover is Esad Ribrich and Tom Muller. So there's like a variant cover with those two. Um the letters in this book are by a chap named Aditya Bidakar. And the colors uh, the colour art is by a Nick Klein and um, a gentleman named Nick Muller takes care of the graphics design in this book, um, which I'll come on to later because that's not something you see every day on a credit for a comic book. So first of all, I just want to get out of the way that this book is gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. It just oozes style. The art and the actual graphic design in the book looks so wonderful to look at. And I think that is actually an important chunk of what this book is about. Um, In the future that we're given here. So this is like another dystopian future. Uh, War is now a spectator sport. Soldiers are like superstars. It's futuristic gladiatorial combat. So people are like live streaming this for entertainment. Soldiers march for fame, profit and glory and it's all super commercial. The world seems to be completely desensitised to this to the point that when when they're fighting and and people are... um, People are in the middle of, uh, you know, like killing each other, ripping each other apart and things like that. The the way that this is talked about, the way the commentators are talking about it, it's it's like you're watching sport, you know. Um, And when someone's someone's dead uh or someone dies the way that they handle that is to talk about it as if you'd be talking about someone who was eliminated from a reality show or sent off from a football match uh (laughs) the graphic design portion of this so uh was talking about the graphic design credit this comes in uh with the aggressive advertising that we get the the aggressive in-story advertising that we're subjected to. So because this is all live streamed and I believe we are supposed to be watching this as a live stream. So when we read it, we're supposed to be streaming this. Um, It's like the entire lives of these soldiers are all on video and it's all for entertainment purposes, like including like recovery after battle. We're seeing this as well. And this is still um, kind of interspersed with advertising. And I think it's supposed to be like that. Um, the the sort of like um, the graphic design is kind of like it's like you're looking through a heads up display and when uh, a character pulls a can of a certain drink out you'll get the logo for the drink appear in the corner and a little blurb about it like so he pops open a can um, and he says at times like these I need a cold one and then you get a commercial message and it says cherry combat for times like these and it's got the cherry combat logo for the drink um and it's it's just interspersed with things like this and and when they're when they're battling you you'll get pop ups uh for like um on the heads up that I guess is uh, supposedly our heads up is a technical you get one that says technical foul technical foul and it's uh, and things like that when people are doing things that they they shouldn't be doing because although this is gladiatorial combat and although this is visceral and and people are killing each other out there on a battlefield there still appears to be rules apparently like you can't um swearing's omitted for some reason even though violence isn't um i think that might be a publishing thing but i think they've they've played with it in a way that swearing would be omitted on the stream um and you get like um where there's like an, an advertising break in the middle of a fight they're forced to stop and they have to wait until the stream resumes if there's a stream problem so, like, you're not allowed to... Uh, you, you'll you get a penalty for killing somebody off camera or something like that. It's weird. Uh, but it's also really, really... Um, like, interesting to see, like, this as, like, the sort of logical end point to a desensitised, heavily commercialised society. Um... There's a lot of uh, full page work in this book. So there's a lot of like beautifully painted full page work. And the whole book actually, it's like painted colour. And it's got kind of this like Mega Drive-y, Mega Drive box art feel about it. Like when you see the cover of the comic especially. You know like those old um, sci-fi video games from the 16-bit era. You'd get like this painted box art. Where it would look like absolutely epic and highly detailed and everything. Yeah. Even though yeah. the game itself was just like a 16 bit sprite fest and 
although sprites are beautiful, they don't come anything close to what was on the cover of the box ever. But obviously it fed your mind's eye. So when you were a kid playing it, you had something as a point of reference to tie up to the to the more abstract thing that was on the screen in front of you, I guess. Um, but that's what it has. It has that feel of that that kind of like old game box top. Um, the um, it's the whole it's it's absolutely gorgeous book as I keep saying, and it's um, the concept and the story are very good. But I think I need a second issue to form a better opinion of what we're looking at and to give you some more thoughts because although it's it's good and although i really enjoyed it on the first pass um going back through on the second pass for the cast i think i'm enjoying it a bit more than i might have originally let on but i think i want a second issue and uh before i go any before i can say much more about it and um yeah before i can become fully invested because we're seeing this this our protagonist, this soldier, who's a high-profile soldier, and he's pushing his body to the limit in order to perform and taking risks and carrying on and things like that. And he's having to be almost rebuilt and everything and all the scars and injuries he endures on the battlefield and everything else. And it's just like, yeah, we're getting glimpses of his self-destructiveness and we're, we're getting shown this this very nihilistic society um, and it's all very satirical and everything else. But I'm, I'm not tied to it yet. There's nothing there to... I mean, I'm going to come back to it because I, the, I guess the thing that's keep, keeping me coming back to it is the overall graphic design and artwork on this thing. But I'm not fully hooked in yet. I'm not fully plugged in. Uh, but we'll see where that goes and I will read issue two. And I think that brings us to the end. That's... There is one thing I wanted to talk about if we've yep. got time. Um, so it's a... I know I keep bringing up games which aren't comics, but they're comic adjacent games. So I picked up a iOS game called Florence. Um so it's an interactive visual puzzle comic game by Anna Panner Interactive, who I believe me and Leon have both talked about on the cast before, um, in the context of Gorogoa, which is uh, one of the games that I called my favorite comic of one of my favorite comics of 2017. Um, Anna Panner also published uh, What Remains of Edith Finch, which is great, but not not in, entirely comic related. Although there is a section of the game which has a pretty cool comic sequence in it, so check that out if you like um it's made by so this game florence um made by an australian studio called mountains um and it's run by ken wong who did another really good ios game called monument valley um florence isn't quite as puzzly or as abstract as gorogoa for example um instead it's more of a linear narrative of a young woman finding love and through that finding her own joy um and it's gamey in the sense that it invokes uh, empathy by having the player participate in interactive representations of her mind state as she goes around her daily life. Sounds a bit waffly, but it's very Annapurna in that way. So if you've played What Remains of Edith Finch, you should know exactly what I mean about this, you know, marriage of gameplay and storytelling. Um, game's got a like a muted pastel color, thick line art style. It's um, reminds me of a picture book. It's kind of abstract in that it's not hugely detailed or anything. Um, there's no words used either in text or in audio so all of the communication in in the game is represented through like empty speech bubbles for example so taking that example we see like discussions and arguments and things happening um through empty speech bubbles it's literally just an empty speech bubble box and colored in um to, you know to represent each individual speaker and the content of the box of the bubbles doesn't really matter but the vibe of the conversation is represented by how these speech bubbles are formed so you um, you know, they appear as jigsaw pieces, which you slot together and the form of their edges and the speed at which you construct them, um, like really deftly represents the tone of the quote unquote dialogue. Um, and so the game's packed full of these kinds of mechanics and moments where you go through the motions using an abstract level of interaction. Uh, and then it's often repeated in a later scene to, you know, provide some pathos. It's really effective. Um, though I can't help but feel like I've seen it all before. Um, you know, in other interactive narratives. So like both in the storytelling and the mechanics it's using. But the charm of it comes from how simple the abstractions and the constructions are. Um, it's really, really well crafted and smooth and like beautiful and pretty. And I was never like taken out of the game by a frustrating mechanic or anything. Um, one thing which I was really pleasantly surprised by is how much Indian culture was shown in this game. I don't want to give too much away. Um, I just want to say that whoever made this game clearly did their research because... 
some of the representations of Indianness was like really on point without being ironically cliched. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a photo of the dev team at the end of the game, and none of them seem Indian, but I don't want to assume, you know, that they didn't grow up in an Indian household or have that background. So, in any case, um, someone in the dev team, if if not being Indian in some way, they've definitely lived with an Indian person before. I can say that. It was, it was pretty cool. Um, overall, I'd say it's worth a punt for only, I think it's $3, and I paid like £2.50-ish or something on it on the App Store. Uh, really sweet short charming experience and definitely worth it for those few moments where the art and the motion and the music and the interaction all come together like in this perfect moment so yeah that's that's uh, florence and it's on the ios store cool yeah um so yeah i guess uh pull this time this episode will be dropping on February 21st, so first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to list out all the things that to look forward to on New Comic Book Day, February 21st. Um, so there's a couple that I've picked, and there's a couple that Ray's picked, um, and I think we're just going to list them all together this time. Uh, usually we go one each, but I think this time we're going to list the whole lot at once. So yeah, February 21st, it. yeah, we've got uh, Hit Girls, uh, Hit Girl even, sorry, Hit Girl number one, uh, which is... Um, it's like Hit Girl's world tour, if you like. Um, she's going to be going from country to country, dispensing justice her way. And uh, it sounds quite interesting. And um, I did, actually, I mean, I, haven't, I hadn't really um, had much time to talk about it. Maybe we'll talk about it next time. But I did read the new Kick-Ass comic as well that, that came out this week. And that was very good. So maybe I'll talk about that in the next cast and we'll might get to talk about Hit Girl as well. Um, we've got Ice Cream Man number two, which is uh, I think after one issue that has been solidified as a cast favorite, hasn't it? Ice Cream Man. Don't jump the gun, but like I read number <laughs> one. Um, yeah, very look, very much looking forward to number two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm I'm willing to say it's my one of my favorites after the first <laughs> issue because I thought it was fantastic. But yeah, I'm looking forward to issue two. So issue two's coming. Uh, we've got uh, Vinegar Teeth number two. Um, Batman number 41 uh, Doctor Strange Damnation number 1 which is um, sort of like a Marvel event it's going to be I think it's going to be a four parter and from the looks of things it follows on from uh, Secret Empire so the, the controversial Secret Empire stuff that nobody asked for and I don't think anyone really liked um, <laughs> <laughs> he he uh, Basically, he raises Las Vegas up from its destruction and inadvertently opens a big door for Mephisto to come through. Um, And Mephisto takes over Las Vegas and sets his sights on the rest of the world. And it's up to the Marvel heroes to fight the King of Hell, basically. Uh, And that sounds quite interesting. And I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to reading that because it's Donny Cates. Um. Donny Cates being the guy f- from books such as Redneck and Tomahawk and other really cool stories. Uh, you've also got the next thing. Uh, so so Marvel are doing this big Infinity event again this year. A new Infinity event, Infinity Countdown. Uh, you've got Infinity Countdown Prime number one this week, uh, which I think will kick off the event. Um, there was kind of a primer for the event, which was the Adam Warlock book that came out. Uh, which I have kind of briefly talked about on Twitter and a little bit on um, uh, Instagram, the Ace Comicals Instagram account, um, and that was very good. And that had, that was the uh, the All Reds doing the artwork for it, which I really like because I love their artwork. So, Infinity Countdown Prime Number One's coming this week, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and also, we've got the conclusion to Punisher Platoon, which was uh, Frank Castle's first command in Vietnam, um, and how that went. So this is like the sort of his first military tour type thing. And this is the conclusion for that. This is number six. On the 28th, we've got the second Hungry Ghosts um, horror anthology book that we've talked about previously. Um, All themed around food and also steeped in Japanese culture and uh, parlor games. You've got John Wick number two. Uh, Lockjaw number one. Now Lockjaw is the big dog that follows the Inhumans about. He's uh, one of the, he's like one of the humans characters. He's this big, huge Saint Bernard looking thing with like a weird antenna thing on his head. Um, 
And um, I think he might have appeared in a couple of books that you read, hasn't he, Ray? Yeah, he's cute, and there might be an appearance by Ms. Marvel, so I'm picking it up. Yeah, because I think <laughs> Lockjaw's been in Ms. Marvel books, hasn't he? He has numerous yeah. times, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've got Abbott number two as well on the 28th. Uh, also on the 28th, you've got Redneck number 10, Legion number two. Legion, very good. Looking forward to number two. Uh, the next Teenage Mutant Ninja, Mutant Ninja Turtles book, TMNT ongoing number 79. Uh, we've got the Terrifics number one. Now, the Terrifics is like a new team of heroes born out of the DC metal event that is sort of coming to a close now. Um, and the main reason that I'm excited about this is because it's got Plastic Man in it. And uh, there's also going to be Peter Parker, Spectacular Spider-Man number 300. I've just put that on there because it's a, it's a, it's a milestone. It's a landmark. It's three, 300 books. So we're going to get the, the number 300. I'm sure Marvel are going to do something special with it. So yeah, that's the uh, that's the roundup of the pool list for the next two weeks. Um, and that will bring us to a close. Unless, Leon, have you got anything to mention? I don't know too much about it, but on uh, Wednesday, um, 21st, yeah, 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time, and 6 p.m. Uh, UK time, uh, Image Expo will be streaming on twitch.tv. I have no idea what to expect because I've never watched uh, a broadcast of uh, Image Expo before, um, but I assume it will be uh, a round of panels and announcements. So um, I'm interested to check that out, um, and I think it would be uh, any of you image lovers out there or image curious people should check it out as well. Definitely, definitely one to look out for. So, that has been Ace Comicals episode number 29. You can find us at www.acecomicals.com. You can find us on Twitter under at Ace Comicals. You can find us on Instagram under Ace Comicals. You can find us on Facebook under Ace Comicals. You can find us on WordPress, which is acecomicals.wordpress.com. Um, you can find us in various places in various podcasting apps you can find us on itunes overcast Pocket Cast, stitcher tune in and castro you can find me on, on twitter under at bato that's b-a-t-t-o-u uh, if you want to field questions to the podcast you can send me a question to my twitter account or you can um field questions to the ace comicals email address which is ace comicals at gmail.com uh leon where can we find you you can find me on twitter at leon ever um recently i've uh, was on episode 272 of uh friends of the show brian and uh askew's anime podcast dynamite in the brain so head over to dynamite in the brain.com or your favorite podcast catcher um, and check out episode 272 where we discuss the anime film Venus Wars. Yes. Ray, where can we find you? You can find me on Twitter at Monke. So that's at M O O N K E H. And I only do this podcast. So if you want to hear my voice, you have to find it here only. Uh, yeah, Rahul's an exclusive. <laughs> Not even a timed exclusive, just an exclusive. So that has been Ace Comicals. Uh, thank you for listening. Ace Comicals over and out.